Uh, good evening. It's about time to begin our Wednesday night uh, worship service. Uh, a few announcements before we get started. Uh, we've got Sunday morning worship at 11. Uh, Wednesday nights are at 7. And uh, we've got the fifth Sunday, August 29th, dinner after church. Uh, I was looking at the list, and I think there's shepherd's pie, chicken bake, hash brown casserole, taco casserole, and squash casserole. And I remember as a kid, uh, that was one of my favorite Sundays to come to was was casserole day. So we've got a lot of good things coming there. Um, we've got laundry ministry Saturday at 12 or at noon. So come out and help support that if you can. Uh, if you would bow with me for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Almighty God, glorious and wonderful is your name. We come to you tonight to worship you and lift each other up as brothers and sisters in Christ. God, we also seek your favor and ask that your spirit fill our heart with your immaculate love. God, we pray as we grow weary through the week and all the things we endure that we remember we can turn to you as a shelter from the storm and to hold to your unchanging steadfast hand. We are but your servants in this world, and we understand we will be tempted and tried. Help us to walk in humility and in your grace. God, be a lamp into our path and teach us to be better stewards of your word. Give us wisdom to choose the walk that will draw us nearer, ever nearer to you. Help us to seek you in every hour, God. We ask that you be with Daniel as he brings your word tonight, that we open our minds and ears and hearts to the message and welcome you in. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we'll have a time of praise and worship. As soon as we get the songs up.
All right, I'm on. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I don't know where most of us are today, but uh, I really appreciate you coming. And we'll be in the Word of God tonight, and we are in Chapter 7 of the book of uh, Mark, um, a book that I have enjoyed, or rather I enjoy uh, studying and having a lot of activities, Jesus doing a lot of things in the book of Mark, and now we are in chapter 7. So last week, uh, we dealt with a portion that was uh, speaking about Jesus uh, feeding the 5,000 people, and after that, he allows his uh, disciples to cross uh, the lake, and he finds that they are struggling later in the evening. He finds that they are struggling, and he walks on the water, and they think he is a go he's a ghost, but uh, he's not. He says, don't be afraid, it's me, and he gets into the boat, and the waves cease, the wind sees, and it's calm. And it's like that's a it's, a, it's a pattern in the book of Ma uh, Mark that uh, ev Jesus does something that is so extraordinary that the people are like, who is this guy? And every time I want uh, you are reading the book of Mark, uh, you have to make note of that because it's like the hearts are searching. They really want to know who this man is. Is this the Messiah that we have been waiting for all this time? The sick are healed. People are, uh, people are receiving forgiveness. Uh, people are receiving deliverance from demon position or, or demon oppression. People are in celebrating or enjoying the works of God uh, through Christ. And uh, that's, the, that's what's going on um, uh, in the book of Mark. But today's passage in the book of uh, in Mark chapter 7 is kind of straightforward. And though the, we are going to cover so many verses, you realize that uh, uh, in this uh, chapter, or in this uh, first passage, it's very, uh, very, very direct and open to interpretation. Like open in the sense, like it's not a difficult passage to to follow what Jesus is trying to do in Mark chapter seven. So for today, uh, I have again divided Mark chapter 7. I'm going to deal with the first 23 verses because they are one. <laughs> and then next week, I'll finish the last uh, few verses or the last portion of Mark 7. So if you look at Mark 7, the passage divides very, very clearly or kind of like very uh, uh, systematic. So the first thing that we are addressing in chapter 7 is uh, the, 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 the Pharisees and the teachers of the law uh, are uh, in a meeting with Jesus and they have a question about eating with unclean hands. Then the second uh, the second part of it Jesus is uh, addressing the crowd to tell them what really defiles a person. Because the, the, the Pharisees are, are saying when you eat, hand, you eat with unclean hands, you defile yourself. But Jesus is going to explain what causes or what can defile a man or a person uh, and uh, that's, uh, in, uh, explain that in, uh, in the public. And then this last portion, the disciples ask Jesus what he has just said in his parable, and he continues to expound on that. So that's why I say this very, uh, very open. Je uh, the, uh, the religious leaders will ask Jesus a question, and Jesus will answer that, that question in the in public and then in the private 
That's one of the things that in the ministry of Jesus, or especially in the book of Mark, the disciples are seeing a lot of things in, in what Jesus is doing, but they still wonder who this guy is. So every time they have something that they need clarified, they will always come back to whatever he has taught and say, ask like, what did you mean by this? Why did you say this? What does this parable mean? And we have seen that in many places as we have covered ground in the book of Mark. So let's uh, dive into the text and uh, uh, read. Uh, so chapter 7, verse 1. Now when the Pharisees uh, gathered to him with some of the scribes, that the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands holding to the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And uh, there are many other traditions that they, they observe, such as the washing of the car, pots, copper vessels, vessel, vessels, and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Uh, last, uh, was it Saturday, Sarah? We had uh, Pastor Scott and Nikki come to our house. We had dinner. Um, and Sarah, before we ate, uh, Sarah was carrying a pot and she washed our hands. And I had not focused that I was going to talk about <laughs> washing hands, but it ties very well. But I kept telling them, well, this is a cultural thing. Pe just wash your hands because uh, the, the meal that we are going to have uh, you, may, you, may, you might not use your, sp your spoon or your fork. You might use your hands. That's why Sarah is cleaning your hands so you can be okay to grab, if it's the steak, or grab whatever is there with your hands and enjoy it. And I kept on telling them, it has, it has nothing to do, to do with anything. It's just Sarah wants to wash our hands so we can eat however we want. But this is different. The religious leader, or rather the Pharisees and the scribes are asking Jesus, why are your disciples not following the traditions of the elders? Why are they eating with hands that are unclean or defiled hands? Because according to them, Eating without wash, having you a, cer a ceremonial washing of your hands defiles who you are as a Jew who worships God, who worships God, the living God, or their God. And if you look at this, because we have, an, we have, we have such an incident, if I may remind you, if you go back to Chapter 3 and beginning from verse 22, they also came from Jerusalem to ask Jesus why he's doing what he's doing. You will realize if you are keen in reading and observing that this is not just an, a, a question like any other question, but they are really having a hard time with what Jesus is doing. It's not just because of the cons concern of the traditions of the elders, but more so because they feel like Jesus is taking over what he has been, what they have been doing. They were the ones controlling the religious matters. Now here comes somebody who is really going against most of what they have been practi practicing because it's not in line with the word of God. So they asked Jesus, why are your disciples eating with hands that have not been washed? Did you realize if you want to find a fault in Daniel, you can find it? 
if you decide, like, well, let me go find something that is not good in Daniel. It won't take you 10 hours. You'll come up with something that you go, oh, no, I don't like it. I don't, because if you are, uh, if I, if I, if I, if all I am doing to Katie is some, to find some fault in her, I will definitely find something. That maybe it's not in line with me, or maybe I don't like it, or I don't know. You will always want. If they are coming to Jesus to ask good, genuine questions about who he is, who he is, they will find. But when they come to Jesus trying to find some fault, they will find it. One time is, why are you healing on the Sabbath? Another time is, who are you to forgive sinners? You remember when the, the guys bring the, uh, the paralyzed guy, the four men bringing the, the paralyzed guy to Jesus, and they dig the roof and they drop the men uh, before Jesus. And Jesus says, son, your son, sins are forgiven. Oh, it's an issue. Who are you to forgive sins? So every time they come because they want to find something fault or to discredit Jesus, they find it. But the good thing with the book of Mark, of the gospel, is that Jesus has a way of answering this question so beautiful that it's just dumbfound, like they don't know what to say next. Because it's just powerful and delivering and setting people free from the teachings, from the miracles, and all that he does just sets people free. Okay? So, Jesus will answer why, will respond rather, Jesus will respond to their question. But here's another thing that you have to notice when we are reading the Gospels especially. Right? Sometimes Jesus doesn't, doesn't answer the question. He speaks something that, doesn't, that, not seem, that does not seem to address the question, but the, the way he puts it, actually comes to be so expounded and so powerful that the answer is within the big teaching of Jesus. So today I told you it's, it's, it's a beautiful text. It has no complex uh, issues to dig out. It's just facts that I'm going to lay out. Are we still together? Yeah, I know. Yeah. So they find something. Verse, uh, uh, let me go back to verse, uh, uh, verse uh, the question. Uh, and the Pharisees and this, this uh, verse uh, five. And the Pharisees and the, the, and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And verse six, and he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching, uh, teaching as doctrines, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So, go back a bit. So they come and they they are sitting and watching every. Uh, this is what they they were always. You read the book of Mark and it's like they are always looking for this uh, wrong Jesus to make a wrong move. And they say, "Okay, we got you there." So they are observing, and while they are eating, they don't wash their hands. So it's a big issue. They ask him, "Why are they not doing what we know that is the tradition?" Of us, we are, we have a tradition from the elders that whenever we eat, we have to wash our hands. So, number one, they find Jesus' disciples, they see that they dish, uh, Jesus' disciples are eating with unclean hands. And by eating with unclean hands, the disciples are breaking the elders' tradition. And by not observing the elders' tradition, the disciples are defiling themselves. If you don't do the tradition, you're defiling yourself. And church, oh, 
friends, we have so many traditions in churches. I can't give you a list of some of the things that have nothing to do with the word of God. Oh, we are so and so. And if you do that, Katie, it's not according to us. If you don't do this, you're not part of us. If you don't do this, you're not part of us. But it has nothing to do with the word of God. It's just a tradition that has been t- t- uh, uh, passed on from year to another year, to a third year, to a fourth year, to a decade, to another decade, to another decade. You ask people why we are doing this. Some people even don't know what we, why we, we are doing it, but we just do it because that's who we are. Am I still having you guys? Traditions of our elders. Okay, so let me go back to some good background here. When God was giving the, uh, the Ten Commandments, so the, what we call uh, the Law of Moses on Mount Sinai, they were written down. But later, the religious leader came up with what we call oral laws, like added a lot of things that were not written down. And they would say or would argue, well, they did not write everything, but this is part of what complements whatever is written. So it's good for us. And let me take it, let me say something here before I continue. Some traditions are good. Hello? Some, some traditions are good. They help people, they help Christians uh, to observe their way of life. But not all traditions help us to live for Christ. So don't call Daniel there. <laughs> I'm saying, some are good. Some have nothing to do with the word of God. This is an example of one. Washing hands does not defile you. But they're saying, yeah, it's a tradition. If you don't do that, yeah, there you go. You mess it up. And so Jesus says, I think Isaiah was right when he prophesied. And I like that. Isaiah was right when he prophesied that the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Two, in vain do they worship me. Teaching doctrines uh, that are uh, teaching as doctrine the, uh, the commandments of God. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are very far from me. Here is how we would describe, I'm I'm sorry, but this is how we would describe being religious. Lip service, nothing to do with the heart. Lip service, nothing to do with the heart relationship with God. And if, and if we're going to, if, if you have time and you read the book of James, it's kind of like he's addressing these issues. I said it another time. Somebody's hungry, Sarah is hungry, and she comes to me, for example, and says, Daniel, I'm hungry. Me, oh, Sarah, you're hungry. You're hungry. You need something to eat. Oh, you know what? And I'm in a position to help, but I can tell Sarah, yeah, I know you're hungry. I know how it feels. You go home. I'm praying for you, and God will supply. It sounds good and very religious. It sounds very beautiful. But really, James would say, ah, no. 
If your brother is hungry, feed them. If they are, they, are, they are cold, give them something to warm them up. If they are without clothes, give them clothes. It's not the lips service only. It's actions that are coming out of your heart. Good deeds that will glorify your God. Whew. Powerful. So the question actually seem, seems to target uh, shaming Jesus, like, ah, now you, to discredit Jesus, like, ah, you are not a good teacher. You have not taught your disciples that the right thing. See, they're not even observing the, the traditions of the, uh, of the elders. And uh, that's just to discredit him. But Jesus has a beautiful way of responding. Are we still together? I hope. <laughs> in the Old Testament, we, we, we read about the washing of hands. And mostly it was the priests, the priests who, would, uh, who were the mediators of the people and God when they gave their offering, the offerings and they, would, they were required to wash hands and all that. But later it became like it's the part and of the Pharisees and the, scri uh, the, the scribes, they made it part of the life of the community, or the, the Jewish community. But initially, it wasn't just out of everybody. But if you want to control people, you come up with good, good tradi uh, traditions. Oh, don't jump two feet, just jump one foot. You'll be a good man. You, you, you come up with some. And you know what? It's so interesting. Human beings sometimes are funny. You can start anything and you'll have followers. <laughs> you can start, literally start anything. Come to church before you get into the building. Go around seven times and take your seat. You will find people will do it. They won't even question, ask, why are we doing this? And it becomes a tradition, and that's who we are. We go around the building seven times and take our seats and listen to a sermon. <sighs> tradition. You can love this, but you can even tell them you don't have to walk into the building. You can walk into the building backwards. And you'll get some people who are over. They won't even ask you. Just walk and take their seats. Traditions. <laughs> but is that what the word of God is teaching? That's what Jesus is trying to tell them. Is this what God really is saying? Or are you teaching commandments or the teaching of men? Is this what God said? Or are we teaching the tradition or traditions of men? So Jesus will not even, does not even go into what they have asked. He brings the whole problem. The problem is not even your question. The problem is you don't know what the scriptures say or what the teachings are. Very dangerous. So here's what God wants us. That's what, one of, uh, what, what Jesus is saying. God desires that we have a heart relationship, not lip service, not just lip service. A heart relationship is important than the traditions that have nothing to do with relationship. That's why he say the people, uh, uh, Isaiah was right when he said the people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Isaiah was crying. It's not about saying it. It's about living it, becoming part of your life. The things of God, the teachings of God, becoming part of who you are. This is very important. You just don't honor with your mouth, with your lips, but it's a hard thing pouring unto God. I'm beginning to feel excited, a bit 
emotional because people are really interested. People are really fond of just the lips. But how about the heart? Can you imagine? The second thing in that is that God desires a real worship from us, not just man-made rules. Verse 7, in vain do they worship me. Let me take you to uh, the book of John chapter 4 where we, um, we meet the Samaritan woman. She comes to the well to fetch water at noon in the afternoon, very hot. And she finds Jesus there. And Jesus says, lady, give me a drink. And the woman is like, oh, who are you? You are a Jew and I am a woman. Jews and I have no relationship. Why would you ask for a cup of, or a glass of or water? Water from me. A Samaritan. And Jesus goes into this discussion. And then he says, a time is coming and now is when the true worshipers of God will worship him in spirit, in truth, and in spirit. Worshiping in spirit and in truth. It's not just, we worship here, we worship here, we worship there. But it's coming when really worship is about the spirit, the heart. I wish the other people were here, man. I'm telling you now. <laughs> the heart thing. Okay, let me repeat. So God desires, number one, God desires that we have a heart relationship, not just lip service. So lip service. God desires, number two, God desires a real worship from us, not man, not following man-made rules. Number three, God desires that we hold his commands or his teaching, not the rules of man. And in order to emphasize those three things that I just mentioned, Jesus will give, me, give an, uh, an illustration. And that's what we read from verse 9. Uh, let's look at verse And he, he, he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting. He's speaking to, the, to addressing the Pharisees in this, uh, in this portion, or rather responding to their question. And he says, you have a... Let's start from verse 8. You, you leave the commandments of God and hold to the traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother and whoever reviles, uh, fathers, uh, reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say... If a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is carbon that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for him, for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. So let me explain this. So Jesus said, this is like what Moses said. You don't want to follow what Moses said. Moses said, honor your father and your mother. Rather, honor your parents. It's one of the commandments. But you guys have a way of just walking, just making a corner of that statement. And you come up with an idea calling it Koban, that the, whatever I was going to give to my father or my mother, I have given it as a, a vow to God. So because I have vowed to give it to God, I don't have to help my parents. I don't have to pay, help my father. I don't have to help my mother. Because whatever I was going to give to them, I have vowed to give it to God. So Jesus is saying, you have a funny way of running away from the commandment and do your own tradition. So I know I've been in America long enough. The culture could be different. Uh, but we're talking of a culture that the, the children, when they grow up, take care of their parents. 
okay? And I don't think I'm very far from me coming from Kenya. It's the same. The elder son kind of become in charge of the family as the parents are wearing out of getting old. <laughs> when the parents are getting old, the elder, elder son takes care of them. But here, they, ha they have a funny way of, of running away from that obligation. They say, well, whatever I was going to give to them, well, I have decided it's come on. I'm going to give it as a gift to God. And Jesus is saying, see, these are the things that I'm talking about. You come up with traditions or issues that you try to away, run away from the teaching, from the commandment of God. So that you can just do your own thing. Run away from responsibilities. Run away from the teachings of God. Run away from what is laid down in scripture so that you can fulfill your tradition. In other words, he, he's calling them back to observe what the word of God is saying and teaching. I don't want to go into details, but do we have it today? <laughs> Do we still have these practices today? Of course we do. I wanted to do this, but because I'm doing this for God. And so, in fact, now it's very funny because I would say I'm, do, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this for God. So the parents miss or the person misses and God misses and we are still free to do whatever we want. And they did that. Some of them would say, the parents, no, I can't give it to you. It's for my, it's for God. Next time maybe, but not now. And then nobody knows that he made a vow. So he won't go to God and he won't go to the parents. He goes to me. And Jesus says, you guys are interesting. You have a funny way of setting aside the teachings of God to do your own thing. And that's not right. So he's not telling them, oh, no, it, uh, it's, they're not defiled. Uh, no, no, no. Let's get it correct. First, of thing, first and foremost, is it a teaching in Scripture? Hello? I wish the rest had come, but okay. Is it a teaching in the Bible that we are following? Or is it my own thing. This is my own teaching. And this is very dangerous because some, it's very dangerous to teach or to base our faith on things that have nothing to do with the scripture. Okay. So, let me make a note here. Jesus is rejecting this tradition or teaching that are, that are not founded on the teachings of the Bible or Scripture. We cannot nullify the Word of God because of our system or tradition or our ways of life. We cannot. We have to live according to to what is taught in scripture. Honoring parents in their time or in our time uh, is, is, is still relevant. It is more than just showing respect, but actually taking care. All right. We're making progress. So if 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 this teaching, if in this teaching you will forget some of the, the verses that I have covered, please don't forget what I just said. God desires that we have a heart, a heart relationship, not just lip service. God desires a really worship from us, not just, med, not just following man-made rules. God desires that we hold his command or his teaching, not just rules of men. That's one portion that is covered. Very important for Jesus. Telling them this is what is important or necessary in living for God. 
So after that, he wants to, uh, so the second portion, so that, after saying that, now he turns to the entire crowd and he calls them. Like the first portion, he was addressing the question and telling them, but now he's going into details and he call, he, he's, he kind of like summons or addresses the entire crowd. He turns around and says, okay, listen to me. And I just even uh, noted that in my notes. Hear me, all of you. That's uh, uh, verse, uh, let, 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 me, let me go back. Uh, verse 14. And, and he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. It's one thing to hear, and it's another thing to understand. Hear me? Hear me? It's one thing to just hear, and it's another thing to understand. And Jesus is using both of them. Hear and understand what I'm just going to tell you. Now he's going back to what they have said, but now he's addressing the entire crowd. Hear me, all of you, and understand. There's nothing outside a person that that by going into him can defile him or make him unclean. But rather, the things that come out of a person are what defiles him or make him unclean. So Jesus is saying, uh, is this, is this, is this uh, biology kind of thing? Or is this uh, anatomy? And it's physiology. You eat and what happens? You go to the bathroom. It doesn't defile you. I know there are some foods that I don't eat, but it's, uh, if you if you eat, I have no problem with them. <laughs> One time we went to a Chinese hotel and we it, it was a lot. Of those, uh, it was a lot of food, you know that. It was a lot of food and. It's, I'm going around, I'm like, okay, chicken, yeah, chicken, whatever. A lot of chicken done in different ways. And then the next thing I'm saying, frog legs. I'm like, I don't eat no frogs. <laughs> I really skip, skip like, oh, no, not, not frog legs now. I, I, I'm okay with chicken. I'm okay with fish. I'm okay with any kind of other meat that was there. But I was like, frog legs. And my daughter, my one of, is it my one of my daughters? But yeah, they taste like chicken. I'm like, if, if they taste like chicken, let me eat the chicken. <laughs> if it tastes like chicken, let me go for the chicken. Don't give me anything that tastes like chicken. But if I eat that. Would I have lost my salvation? Oh, no. So Jesus is saying, you guys are just focused on something that does not really defile. I will tell you what defiles a person. It's not that. It's your traditions just don't help. The word of God is clear. What helps you? So don't tell people that I don't like frog legs. Now, I'm a preacher. I might be served the frog legs in the house. <laughs> Just don't tell me. Let me eat and say, Daniel, how was it? I enjoyed it. Good for you. And then I go home. <laughs> so, in, so in the context of eating food, Jesus is saying that food cannot defile us, defile a person. Or purity is not about what one eats. What he's talking about is there's some, some things that can defile us. And those things proceed from within us. That's what Jesus will hammer in this uh, passage. Verse 17, and when he had entered, uh, verse 15, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. 
And then when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. So he has said that in general, but don't worry, crowd. Don't worry about this question that you are hearing. There's nothing that you eat that defies you. But I'm going to I'm going to explain. So while he when he said that he left and went into a private uh, place, and the disciples asked him, and that's what uh, the last portion that I want us to to dwell in. And verse eighteen, and he said to them, then I then uh, sorry. Let's say seven. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes in a person from outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is, and is expelled? And then very powerful statement. Thus, he, he, call, he declared all food clean. Food does not. Okay. I know. Some people will like, oh, kosher. That's okay. In fact, Paul makes it clear later. Paul says, if you want to eat food and Daniel doesn't like you, the good thing is you can eat while he's not there. How about that? Paul is, Paul is just e expounding on that. For the sake of you, I can decide not to eat this. Just for the sake of you, as my brother, as my sister in Christ, I may decide, no, he doesn't like me. So, Paul doesn't say, no, don't eat it. He just says, just be careful with the other brother. That's all. That's the rule. That's the only thing. Just be careful with the other brother. The brother, the other sister. Just make sure you don't, off, you, you, you don't create, uh, become a stumbling block to a brother who doesn't enjoy uh, your test. So food in itself is clean. We can eat. Food does not defile a person because it does not go to the heart. Rather... It goes to the stomach. But then, if I was to leave it there, it wouldn't be complete. So, Jesus is adding. Whatever comes out of a person is what defiles him. Verse 20. Very important in this passage. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For, for from within, from within, out of the heart of man comes the following list. And Jesus gives a list of the things that can defile us. Number one, sexual immorality. Number two, theft. Number three, murder. Number four, adultery. Number five, desire for riches or greed. What defiles a man? Number six, wickedness or wicked deeds. What defiles a man, a woman? Deceit. Number eight, what defiles a man? Outrageous behavior. What defiles a man? An envious eye or envy. What defiles a man? Evil. What defiles a man or woman? Blasphemy. What defiles a man, Daniel? Houndness or pride. What defiles a man, Daniel? Boastful. Or arrogance. He gives about 13 issues that are really issues that can defile you and me. Not the food, not your traditions, but this long list. 
can defy us. And the good, the, the thing about this long list, if you if you are, if you are keen, you go and study on your time in your in your own time, you realize that it all has to do with me, something that gratifies me, something that feel, makes me feel good. It's all thing. This list is all about me, me, me. For success, for greatness, huh? for fame, for in enjoying myself. These are the things that come up from within us and make defile us, make us unclean in before God. But sometimes we focus on things that have nothing to do with us. In fact, you can compare this list with uh, Paul's list in Galatians chapter 5. Let me just read Galatians chapter 5. Uh, to just, uh, if you have your, you go to Galatians chapter 5. Uh, the man, the few, uh, few alterations, but it seems like uh, it's uh, the same uh, list, uh, kind of. Chapter 5, verse 16 of Galatians. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify. So these are the things that, uh, as a human being, you feel like they gratify you. They make you, who, they make you feel good, like things that gratif gratify you. So Paul says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh... Uh, against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are the these are there are these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident: sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, and enmity, strife, jealousy, fit of anger, rivalry, rivalries, uh, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like this. I, I warn you, as I warned before, that those who have who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So. Paul is expounding on that a list that uh, is basically coming from the desires of the flesh. This body wants things that it doesn't care. It just wants things. Just want things that have nothing. Some most sometimes have nothing to do with what God says. But the body is like, yeah, I want it. I want it. Is it a cut? I want it. So this teaching tonight is calling us, me and you, to desire the things of God. Worshiping God from the heart. Not lip service. Loving God from the heart. And be careful with things that defile us or will make us not be good Christians. I'm making it very simple. Things that will distract us from the way of God, from the ways of God. Those things that defile us have nothing to do with him. They have, not, they have everything to do with what comes in us, from, from within us. Things that gratify my body. Things that gratify the physical, but have nothing to do with God. Is it any clear? If, I mean, to me, for me, uh, chapter 7, verse 1 to 26, is just laying it very clear. You don't, you don't need to dig deep to come up with what Jesus is want, wanting to say. Stop your traditions if they are not in line with the word of God. <laughs> because you have a way of setting aside uh, the things of God to follow your tradition. Stop it. That's what he's trying to say. And he says that, but I will, I will give you, I will tell you what can really uh, defile you. 
and he gives that long list. Tonight, let's go out and let's let it be out by the heart relating. Heart relationship, not lip service. And telling God to help us to walk in a way that we will not do things that will de defile our relationship with our Savior. That's a very good place to end tonight. Let me pray for you, for us. Let me pray for us tonight, and we will leave. God, we thank you for this tonight. Um, thank you for this passage that is so clear, telling us to avoid things that have nothing to do with your word, and to be careful about what could defile us as we live for you. We thank you tonight. Uh, we ask you to be with us as we go home. We pray for all our friends who are not able to be here tonight. I have information that some people are sick. God, we ask you that you may stretch forth your hand and heal your people. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you tonight. Let's leave the word of God.